Chapter 3 The War in Tlashkala From the little town belonging to Zalashenko, where they gave us a golden necklace and some cloth and two Indian women, we sent two Sempawalan chieftains as messengers to Tlashkala with a letter and a fluffy red Flemish hat, such as was then worn. We well knew that the Tlashkalans could not read the letter, but we thought that when they saw the paper different from their own, they would understand that it contained a message, and what we sent to them was that we were coming to their town and hoped they would receive us well, as we came not to do them harm but to make them our friends. We did this because in this little town they assured us that the hold of Tlashkala was up in arms against us, for it appears that they had already received news of our approach, and that we were accompanied by many friends, both from Sempuala and Shokotan, and other towns through which we had passed. As all these towns usually paid tribute to Montezuma, the Tlashkalans took it for granted that we were coming to attack Tlashkala, as their country had often been entered by craft and cunning and then laid waste. And they thought that this was another attempt to do so. So as soon as our two messengers arrived with the letter and the hat and began to deliver their message, they were seized as prisoners before their story was even finished, and we waited all that day and the next for an answer, and none arrived. Then Cortez addressed the chiefs of the town where we had halted, and repeated all he was accustomed to tell the Indians about our holy religion, and many other things which we usually repeated in most of the towns we passed through. And after making them many promises of assistance, he asked for twenty Indian warriors of quality to accompany us on our march, and they were given us most willingly. After commending ourselves to God, with a happy confidence, we set out on the following day for Tlashkala, and as we were marching along, we met our two messengers who had been taken prisoner. It seems that the Indians who guarded them were perplexed by the warlike preparations, and had been careless of their charge, and had in fact let them out of prison. They arrived in such a state of terror at what they had seen and heard, that they could hardly succeed in expressing themselves. According to their account, when they were prisoners, the flash colors had threatened them, saying, Now we are going to kill those whom you call Teules, and eat their flesh, and we will see whether they are as valiant as you announce, and we shall eat your flesh too, and you who come here with treasons and lies from that traitor Montezuma. And for all that the messengers could say, that we were against the Macons and wished to be brothers to the Tlashkalans, they could not persuade them of its truth. When Cortez and all of us heard those haughty words and learned how they were prepared for war, although it gave us matter for serious thought, we all cried, If this is so forward and good luck to us, we committed ourselves to God and marched on, the Alfre Corral unfurling our banner and carrying it before us, for the people of the little town where we had slept, as well as the Sempualans, assured us that the Tlashkalans would come out to meet us and resist our entry into their country. In this way we marched about two leagues, when we came upon a fortress strongly built of stone and lime and some other cement, so strong that with iron pickaxes it was difficult to demolish it, and it was constructed in such a way, both for offense and defense, that it would be very difficult to capture. We halted to examine it, and Cortez asked the Indians from Xocotlan for what purpose the fortress had been built in such a way. They replied that, as war was always going on between the people of Tlaxcala and their lord Montezuma, the Tlaxcalans had built this fort so strong, the better to defend their towns, for we were already in their territory. We rested a while, and this, our entry into the land of Tlaxcala and the fortress, gave us plenty to think about. Cortez said, Sirs, let us follow our banner, which bears the sign of the Holy Cross, and through it we shall conquer. Then one and all we answered him, May good fortune attend our advance, for in God lies the true strength. So we began our march again in the order I have already noted. We had not gone far when our scouts observed about thirty Indians who were spying. These spies wore devices and feather headdresses, and when our scouts observed them, they came back to give us notice. Cortez then ordered the same scouts to follow the spies, and to try and capture one of them without hurting them, and then he sent five more mounted men as a support in case there should be an ambush. Then all our army hastened on, for our Indian friends who were with us said that there was sure to be a large body of warriors waiting in ambush. When the thirty Indian spies saw the horsemen coming towards them, 
and beckoning to them with their hands. They would not wait for them to come up and capture one of them. Furthermore, they defended themselves so well that with their swords and lances they wounded some of the horses. When our men saw how fiercely the Indians fought, and that their horses were wounded, they were obliged to kill the five of the Indians. As soon as this happened, a squadron of Tlashkalans, more than three thousand strong, which was lying in ambush, fell on them all of a sudden, with great fury, and began to shower arrows on our horsemen who were now all together, and they made a good fight with their arrows and fire-hardened darts, and did wonders with their two-handed swords. At this moment we came up with our artillery, muskets, and crossbows, and little by little the Indians gave way, but they had kept their ranks and fought well for a considerable time. In this encounter they wounded four of our men, and I think that one of them died of his wounds a few days later. It was now late that Lash Collins beat a retreat, and we did not pursue them. They left about seventeen dead on the field, and many wounded. Where these skirmishes took place, the ground was level, and there were many houses and plantations of maize and magwe, which is the plant from which they make their wine. We slept near a stream, and with the grease from a fat Indian whom we had killed and cut open, we dressed our wounds, for we had no oil, and we supped very well on some dogs which the Indians breed for food, for all the houses were abandoned and the provisions carried off, and they had even taken the dogs with them. But these came back to their homes in the night, and there we captured them and they proved good enough food. All night we were on the alert with watches and patrols and scouts, and the horses bitted and saddled in fear, lest the Indians would attack us. The next day as we marched on, two armies of warriors approached to give us battle. They numbered six thousand men, and they came on us with loud shouts and the din of drums and trumpets as they shot their arrows and hurled their darts and acted like brave warriors. Cortez ordered us to halt, and sent forward the three prisoners whom we had captured the day before, to tell them not to make war on us as we wished to treat them as brothers. He also told one of our soldiers, named Diego de Godoy, who was a royal notary, to watch what took place, so that he could bear witness if it should be necessary, so that at some future time we should not have to answer for the deaths and damages which were likely to take place, for we begged them to keep the peace. When the three prisoners whom we had sent forward began to speak to the Indians, it only increased their fury, and they made such an attack on us that we could not endure it. Then Cortez shouted, Santiago and hut them! And we attacked them with the, such impetuosity that we killed and wounded many of them with our fire, among them three captains. They then began to retire towards some ravines where over forty thousand warriors and their captain general, named Jicotenga, were lying in ambush, all wearing a red and white device, for that was the badge and livery of Jigotenga. As there was broken ground there, we could make no use of the horses, but by careful maneuvering we got past it. But the passage was very perilous, for they made play with their good archery, and with their lances and broadswords did us much hurt, and the hail of stones from their slings was even more damaging. When we reached the level ground with our horsemen and artillery, we paid them back and slew many of them, but we did not dare to break our formation, for any soldier who left the ranks to follow some of the Indian captains and swordsmen was at once wounded and ran great danger. As the battle went on, they surrounded us on all sides, and we could do little or nothing. We dared not charge them unless we charged all together, lest they should break up our formation. And if we did charge them, as I have said, there were twenty squadrons ready to resist us, and our lives were in great danger, for they were so numerous they could have blinded us with handfuls of earth, if God in his great mercy had not succored us. While we found ourselves in this conflict among these great warriors and their fearful broadswords, we noticed that many of the strongest among them crowded together to lay hands on a horse. They set to work with a furious attack, laying hands on a good mare known to be very handy, either for sport or for charging. The rider, Pedro de Moron, was a very good horseman, and as he charged with three other horsemen into the ranks of the enemy, the Indian seized hold of his lance, and he was not able to drag it away, and others gave him cuts with their broadswords and wounded him badly. And then they slashed at the mare, and cut her head off at the neck, but it hung by the skin, and she fell dead. If his mounted companions had not come at once to his rescue, they would also have finished killing Pedro de Moron. We might possibly have helped him with our whole battalion, but I repeat again that we hardly dared to move from one place to another for fear that they would finally rout us, and we could not move one way or another. It was all we could do to hold our own and prevent ourselves from being defeated. 
However, we rushed the conflict around the mare and managed to save Moron from the hands of the enemy who were already dragging him off half dead, and we cut the mare's girths so as not to leave the saddle behind. In that act of rescue, ten of our men were wounded, and I remember that at the same time we killed four of the Indian captains, for we were advancing in close order and we did great execution with our swords. When this had happened, the enemy began to retire, carrying the mare with them, and they cut her in pieces to exhibit in all the towns of Tlashkala, and we learned afterwards that they had made an offering to their idols of the horseshoes, of the Flemish felt hat, and of the two letters which we had sent them offering peace. We were a full hour fighting in the fray, and our shots must have done the enemy much damage, for they were so numerous and in such close formation that each shot must have hit many of them. Horsemen, musketeers, crossbowmen, swordsmen, and those who used lance and shield, one and all, we fought like men to save our lives and to do our duty, for we were certainly in the greatest danger in which we had ever found ourselves. Later on they told us that we killed many Indians in this battle, and among them eight of their leading captains, sons of the old caciques, who lived in their principal towns, and for this reason they drew off in good order. We did not attempt to follow them, and we were not sorry for it, as we were so tired out we could hardly stand, and we stayed where we were in that little town. All the country round was thickly peopled, and they even have some houses underground, like caves in which many of the Indians live. The place where this battle took place is called Tewasingo, and it was fought on the second day of the month of September in the year 1519. When we saw that victory was ours, we gave thanks to God, who had delivered us from such great danger. From the field of battle we withdrew the whole force to some queues which were strong and lofty like a fortress. We dressed the wounded men, who numbered fifteen, with the fat of an Indian. One man died of his wounds. We also doctored four or five horses which had received wounds, and we rested and supped very well that night, for we found a good supply of poultry and little dogs. And taking every precaution by posting spies, patrols, and scouts, we rested until the next morning. In that battle we captured fifteen Indians, two of them chieftains. There was one peculiarity that the Tlashkalans showed in this and all the other battles. That was to carry off any Indian as soon as he was wounded, so that we should not be able to see their dead. As we felt weary after the battles we had fought, and many of the soldiers and horses were wounded, and some died there, and it was necessary to repair the crossbows and replenish our stock of darts, we passed one day without doing anything worthy of mention. The following morning Cortez said that it would be well for all the horsemen who were fit for work to scour the country, so that the Tlashkalans should not think that we had given up fighting on account of the last battle, and that they should see that we meant to follow them up and it was better for us to go out and attack them than for them to come and attack us, and thus find out our weakness. As the country was level and thickly populated, we set out with seven horsemen, and a few musketeers and crossbowmen, and about two hundred soldiers, and our Indian allies, leaving the camp as well guarded as was possible. In the houses and towns through which we passed, we captured about twenty Indian men and women, without doing them any hurt. But our allies, who are a cruel people, burnt many of the houses and carried off much poultry and many dogs for food. When we returned to the camp, which was not far off, Cortez set the prisoners free, after giving them something to eat, and Doña Marina and Aguilar spoke kindly to them, and gave them beads, and told them not to be so mad any longer, but to make peace with us, as we wished to help them and treat them as brothers. Then we also released the two prisoners, who were chieftains, and they were given another letter, and were to tell the high caciques who lived in the town, which was the capital of all the towns of the province, that we had not come to do them any harm, or to annoy them, but to pass through their country on our way to Mexico to speak to Montezuma. The two messengers went to Chicotenga's camp, which was distant about two leagues, and when they gave them the letter and our message, the reply that their captain Chicotenga gave them was, that we might go to his town where his father was living, that their peace would be made by satiating themselves on our flesh, and honor paid to his gods with our hearts and blood, and that we should see his answer the very next day. When Cortez and all of us heard that haughty message, as we were already tired out with the battles and encounters we had passed through, we certainly did not think that things looked well. So Cortez flattered the messengers with soft words, 
for it seemed that they had lost all fear, and ordered them to be given some strings of beads, as he wished to send them back as messengers of peace. Cortez then learned from them more fully all about Captain Chicotenga and what forces he had with him. They told him that Chicotenga had many more men with him now than he had when he attacked us before, for he had five captains with him, and each captain had brought ten thousand warriors. This was the way in which the count was made. Of the followers of Chicotenga, who was blind from age, the father of the captain of the same name, ten thousand. Of the followers of another great chief named Maseescasi, another ten thousand. Of the followers of another great chief named Chichimecatecle, the same number. Of another great cacique, Lord of Topeyanco, named Tika Pacaneca, another ten thousand. And of another great chief named Guashoban, another ten thousand. So that there were in all fifty thousand. That their banner and standards had been brought out, which was a white bird with the appearance of an ostrich with wings outstretched, and as though it wished to fly, and that each company had its device and uniform, for each cacique had a different one, as do our dukes and counts in our own Castile. All that I have here said we accepted as perfectly true, for certain Indians among those whom we had captured and who were released that day related it very clearly, although they were not then believed. When we knew this, as we were but human and feared death, many of us, indeed the majority of us, confessed to the Padre de la Merced and to the priest Juan Diaz, who were occupied all night in hearing our repentance and commending us to God and praying that we would pardon us and save us from defeat. The next morning, the 5th September, 1519, we mustered the horses, there was not one of the wounded men who did not come forward to join the ranks and give as much help as he could. The crosswomen were warned to use the store of darts very cautiously, some of them loading while the others were shooting, and the musketeers were to act in the same way, and the men with sword and shield were instructed to aim their cuts and thrusts at the bowels of their enemies, so that they would not dare to come as close to us as they did before. With our banner unfurled, and four of our comrades guarding the standard-bearer corral, we set out from our camp. We had not marched half a quarter of a league before we began to see the fields crowded with warriors with great feather crests and distinguishing devices, and to hear the blare of horns and trumpets. All the plain was swarming with warriors, and we stood four hundred men in number, and of those many sick and wounded, and we knew for certain that this time our foe came with the determination to leave none of us alive, excepting those who would be sacrificed to their idols. How they began to charge on us! What a hail of stones sped from their slings! As for their bowmen, the javelins lay like corn on the threshing floor, all of them barbed and fire-hardened, which would pierce any armor and would reach the vitals where there is no protection. The men with swords and shields and other arms larger than swords, such as broadswords and lances, how they pressed on us and with what valor! What mighty shouts and yells they charged upon us! The steady bearing of our artillery, musketeers, and crossbowmen was indeed a help to us, and we did the enemy much damage, and those of them who came close to us with their swords and broadswords met with such sword play from us that they were forced back, and they did not close in on us so often as in the last battle. The horsemen were so skillful and bore themselves so valiantly that, after God who protected us, they were our bulwark. However, I saw that our troops were in considerable confusion, so that neither the shouts of Cortez nor the other captains availed to make them close up their ranks, and so many Indians charged down on us that it was only by a miracle of swordplay that we could make them give way so that our ranks could be reformed. One thing only saved our lives, and that was that the enemy were so numerous and so crowded one on another that the shots wrought havoc among them, and in addition to this they were not well commanded for all the captains with their forces could not come into action, and from what we knew, since the last battle had been fought, there had been disputes and quarrels between the captain Chicotenga and another captain, the son of Chichimecatecle, over what the one had said to the other, that he had not fought well in the previous battle. To this the son of Chichimecatecle replied that he had fought better than Chicotenga, and was ready to prove it by personal combat. 
So in this battle, Chichimecatecla and his men would not help Jicotenga, and we knew for a certainty that he had also called on the company of Huesotzinco to abstain from fighting. Besides this, ever since the last battle, they were afraid of the horses and the musketry and the swords and crossbows and our hard fighting. Above all, was the mercy of God which gave us strength to endure. So Shikotenga was not obeyed by two of the commanders, and we were doing great damage to his men, for we were killing many of them. And this they tried to conceal, for as they were so numerous, whenever one of their men was wounded, they immediately bound him up and carried him off on their soldiers, so that in this battle... As in the last, we never saw a dead man. The enemy were already losing heart, and knowing that the followers of the other two captains whom I've already named would not come to their assistance, they began to give way. It seems that in that battle we had killed one very important officer, and the enemy began to retreat in good order, our horsemen following them at a hard gallop for a short distance, for they could not sit their horses for fatigue, and when we found ourselves free from that multitude of warriors, we gave thanks to God. In this engagement, one soldier was killed, and sixty were wounded, and all the horses were wounded as well. They gave me two wounds, one in the head with a stone and one in the thigh with an arrow, but this did not prevent me from fighting and keeping watch and helping our soldiers, and all the soldiers who were wounded did the same, for if the wounds were not very dangerous, we had to fight and keep guard, wounded as we were, for a few of us remained unwounded. Then we returned to our camp, well contented, and giving thanks to God. We buried the dead in one of those houses which the Indians had built underground, so the enemy should not see that we were mortals, but should believe that, as they said, we were Teules. We threw much earth over the top of the house, so that they should not smell the bodies. Then we doctored all the wounded with the fat of an Indian. It was cold comfort to be even without salt or oil with which to cure the wounded. There was another want from which we suffered, and it was a severe one, and that was clothes with which to cover ourselves, for such a cold wind came from the snow mountains that it made us shiver, for our lances and muskets and crossbows made a poor covering. That night we slept with more tranquility than on the night before, when we had so much duty to do with scouting spies, watchmen, and patrols. After the battle which I have described was over, in which we had captured three Indian chieftains, our captain Cortez sent him at once in company with the two others who were in our camp, and who had already been sent as messengers, and ordered them to go to the caciques of Tlaxcala, and tell them that we begged them to make peace, and to grant us a passage through their country on our way to Mexico, and to say that they did not now come to terms, we would slay all their people, but that, as we were well disposed towards them, we had no desire to annoy them, unless they gave us reason to do so. And he said many flattering things to them so as to make friends of them. And the messengers then set out eagerly for the capital of Tlaxcala, and gave their message to all the caciques already mentioned by me, whom they found gathered in council with many other elders and priests. They were very sorrowful both over the want of success in the war, and at the death of those captains, their sons and relations, who had fallen in battle. As they were not very willing to listen to the message, they decided to summon all the soothsayers, priests, and those others called Takalnagua. And they told them to find out from their witchcraft, charms, and lots what people we were, and if by giving us battle day and night without ceasing we could be conquered, and to say if we were Teules, as the people of Sempuala asserted, and to tell them what things we ate, and ordered them to look into all these matters, with the greatest care. When the soothsayers and wizards and many priests had got together and made their prophecies and forecasts and performed all the other rites according to their use, it seems that they said that by their definitions they had found out we were men of flesh and blood and ate poultry and dogs and bread and fruit when we had them and that we did not eat the flesh nor the hearts of the Indians whom we killed. It seems that our Indian friends, whom we had brought from Sempoala, had made them believe that we were Teules, and that we ate the hearts of Indians, and that the cannon shot forth lightning, such as falls from heaven, and that the lurcher, which was a sort of lion or tiger, and the horses were used to catch Indians when we wanted to kill them, and much more nonsense of the same sort. 
The worst of all that the priests and wizards told the caciques was that it was not during the day, but only at night, that we could be defeated, for as night fell all our strength left us. When the caciques heard this, and they were quite convinced of it, they sent to tell their captain, General Shikotenga, that as soon as it was possible he should come and attack us in great force by night. On receiving this order, Shikotenga assembled ten thousand of the bravest of his Indians and came to our camp and from three sides they began alternately to shoot arrows and throw single-pointed javelins from their spear-throwers, and from the fourth side the swordsmen and those armed with makanas and broadswords approached so suddenly that they felt sure that they would carry some of us off to be sacrificed. Our Lord God provided otherwise, for secretly as they approached they found us well on the alert, and as soon as our outposts and spies perceived the great noise of their movement, they ran at breakneck speed to give the alarm, and as we were all accustomed to sleep ready shod, with our arms on us and our horses bitted and saddled, and with all our arms ready for use, we defended ourselves with guns, crossbows, and sword play, so that they soon turned their backs. As the ground was level and there was a moon, the horsemen followed them a little way, and in the morning we found lying on the plain about twenty of them dead and wounded. So they went back with great loss and sorely repenting this night expedition. And I have heard it said that, as what the priests and wizards had advised did not turn out well, they sacrificed two of them. That night one of our Indian friends from Sempawala was killed, and two of our soldiers were wounded and one horse, and we captured four of the enemy. When we found that we had escaped from that impetuous attack, we gave thanks to God, and we buried our Sempawala friend, and tended the wounded and the horse, and slept the rest of the night after taking every precaution to protect the camp, as was our custom. When we awoke and saw how all of us were wounded, even with two or three wounds, and how weary we were, how others were sick and clothed in rags, knew that Shikotenga was always after us, and already over forty-five of our soldiers had been killed in battle, or succumbed to disease and chills, and another dozen of them were ill, and our Captain Cortez himself was suffering from fever, as well as the Padre de la Merced, and what with our labors and the weight of our arms, which we always carried on our backs, and other hardships from chills and the want of salt, for we could never find any to eat, we began to wonder what would be the outcome of all this fighting and what we should do, and where we should go when it was finished. To march into Mexico we thought too arduous an undertaking, because of its great armies, and we said to one another that if those clash collins, which our Sempawalan friends had led us to believe were peacefully disposed, could reduce us to these straits, what would happen when we found ourselves at war with the great forces of Montezuma? In addition to this, we had heard nothing from the Spaniards whom we had left settled in Villa Rica, nor they of us. As there were among us very excellent gentlemen and soldiers, steady and valiant men of good counsel, Cortez never said or did anything important without first asking his advice and acting in concert with us. One and all we put heart into Cortez and told him that he must get well again and reckon upon us, and that as with the help of God we had escaped from such perilous battles, our Lord Jesus Christ must have preserved us for some good end that he, Cortez, should at once set our prisoners free and send them to the head caciques so as to bring them to peace, when all that had taken place would be pardoned, including the death of the mayor. Let us leave this, and say how Doña Marina, who, although a native woman, possessed such manly vigor that, although she had heard every day how the Indians were going to kill us and eat our flesh with chili, and had seen us surrounded in the late battles, and knew that all of us were wounded and sick, yet never allowed us to see any sign of fear in her, only a courage passing that of a woman. So Doña Marina and Geronimo de Aguilar spoke to the messengers whom we were now sending, and told them that they must come and make peace at once, and that if it was not concluded within two days, we should go and kill them all, and destroy their country, and would come to seek them in their city, and with these brave words, they were dispatched to the capital where Shikotenga the Elder and Masay Askasi were residing. When the messengers arrived at Tlashkala, they found the two principal caciques in consultation, namely Masay Askasi and Shikotenga the Elder, the father of the Captain General Shikotenga. 
When they had heard of the embassy, they were undecided and kept silence for a few moments, and it pleased God to guide their thoughts towards making peace with us, and they sent at once to summon all the other caciques and captains who were in their towns, and those of a neighboring province called Wixotzingo, who were their friends and allies. And when all had come together, Masayaskazi and Shikotenga the elder, who were very wise men, made them a speech, as we afterwards learned, to the following effect. If not exactly in these words. Brothers and friends, you have already seen how many times these Tehules, who are in this country expecting to be attacked, have sent us messengers asking us to make peace, saying that they come to assist us and adopt us as brothers, and you have also seen how many times they have taken prisoners, number of our vassals, to whom they do no harm, and whom they quickly set free. You well know how we have three times attacked them with all our forces, both by day and by night, and have failed to conquer them, and that they have killed during the attacks we made on them, many of our people, and of our sons, relations, and captains. Now again they have sent to ask us to make peace, and the people of Sempuala, whom they are bringing in their company, say that they are the enemies of Montezuma and his Mexicans, and have ordered the towns of the Totonac Sierra, and those of Sempuala, no longer to pay tribute to Montezuma. You will remember well enough that the Mexicans make war on us every year, and have done so for more than a hundred years, and you can readily see that we are hemmed in in our own lands, so that we do not dare to go outside even to seek for salt, so that we have none to eat, and we have no cotton, and bring in very little cotton cloth, and if some of our people go out or have gone out to seek for it, few of them return alive, for those traitorous Mexicans and their allies kill them, or make slaves of them. Our wizards and soothsayers and priests have told us what they think about the persons of these Tehus, and that they are very valiant. It seems to me that we should seek to be friends with them, and in either case, whether they be men or Tehus, that we should make them welcome, and that four of our chieftains should set out at once, and take them plenty to eat, and should offer them friendship and peace, so that they should assist us and defend us against our enemies, and let us bring them here to us, and give them women, so that we may have relationship with their offspring, for the ambassadors whom they have sent to treat for peace tell us that they have some women with them. When they had listened to this discourse, all the caciques and chiefs approved of it, and said it was a wise decision, and that peace should be made at once, and that notice should be sent to the captain Shikotenga, and the other captains who were with him to return at once, and not to attack again, and that they should be told that peace was already made, and messengers were immediately sent off to announce it. However, the captain Shikotenga the younger would not listen to the four chiefs, and got very angry and used abusive language against them, and said he was not for peace, where he had already killed many of the Tulis and Amer, and that he wished to attack us again by night, and completely conquer us and slay us. When his father, Shikotenga the Elder, and Maseskazi and the other caciques heard this reply, they were very angry, and sent orders at once to the captains and to all the army, that they should not join Shikotenga in attacking us again, and should not obey him in anything that he ordered unless it was in making peace. And even so, he would not obey. And when they, the caciques, saw the disobedience of their captain, they at once sent the same four chieftains whom they had sent before to bring food to our camp and treat for peace in the name of Tlaxcala and Wixosinko. But from fear of Jicotenga the Younger, the four old men did not come at that time. As two days had passed without our doing anything worthy of record, we suggested to Cortez, and it was agreed to, that as there was a town about one league distant from our camp, which had sent no reply when summoned to make peace, that we should march against it by night and take it by surprise, not with intent to do it any harm. I mean, not to kill the wounded's inhabitants or take them prisoners, but to carry off food and to frighten or talk them into making peace, according to the way they might act. This town was called Zumpanzingo, and was the capital of many other small towns, and the township where our camp was placed was subject to it, and all round about it was thickly peopled. So one night, long before the approach of dawn, we rose early to go to that town with six of the best horsemen and the healthiest of the soldiers, and ten crossbowmen and eight musketeers, 
with Cortez as our captain, although he was suffering from tar Tartian fever, and we left the camp as well guarded as was possible. We started on a march two hours before dawn came, and there was such a cold wind that morning blowing down from the snowy mountains that it made us shiver and shake, and the horses we had with us felt it keenly, for two of them were seized with colic and were trembling all over, which worried us a good deal as we feared that they would die. Cortez ordered their owners to take them back to the camp and try to cure them. As the town was not far off, we arrived there before daylight, and when the natives perceived our approach, they fled from their houses, shouting to one another to look out for the tools who were coming to kill them, and the parents, in their panic, did not even wait to look after their children. When we saw what was happening, we halted in a court until it was daylight, so as not to do the people any harm. As soon as the priests who were in the temples, the elders of the town, and some of the old chieftains saw that we stood there without doing any harm, they came to Cortez and asked his pardon for not coming to our camp peacefully and bringing food when we had summoned them to do so, the reason being that the captain, Chicotenga, who was in the neighborhood, had sent to them to say that they should not give us any, because his camp was supplied from that town and from many others, and he had with him as warriors and sons of the people of that town from all the territory of Tlaxcala. Cortez told them through Doña Marina and Aguilar, who always went with us on every expedition, even when it took place at night, to have no fear but to go at once to the caciques at the capital and tell them to come and make peace, for the war was disastrous to them, and he, Cortez, sent those same priests as messengers, for by the other messengers whom we had sent we had so far received no reply whatever. These priests of the town quickly searched for more than forty cocks and hens, and two women to grind tortillas, and brought them to us, and Cortez thanked them for it, and ordered them at once to send twenty Indians to our camp, and they came with the food, and without any fear whatever, and stayed in the camp until the afternoon, and they were given little beads with which they returned well contented to their homes, and in all the small hamlets in our neighborhood they spread word that we were good because we caused them no annoyance, and the priests and elders sent notice to the captain Chicotenga and told him how they had given us the food and the women, and he rated them severely. And they went at once to the capital to make it known to the old caciques. As soon as they heard that we had not done the people any harm, although we might have killed many of them that night, and that we were sending them to treat for peace, they were greatly pleased, and ordered that we should be supplied every day with all that we needed. And they again ordered the four caciques, whom they had before charged with the mission of peace, to depart instantly for our camp and carry with them all the food that had been prepared. We then returned to our camp with our supplies of food and the Indian women, all of us well contented. However, on our return, we found that there had been meetings and discussions in camp about the very great danger we were running day by day during this war, and on our arrival the discussion grew most lively. Those who talked most and were most persistent were those who had left houses and assignments of Indians behind them in Cuba, and as many as seven of these men, whose names I will not mention so as to save their honor, met together and went to the hut where Cortez was lodging, and one of them who spoke for all for he was very fluent of speech and knew very well what they had come to propose, said, as though he were giving advice to Cortez, that if he should wish to preserve his life and the lives of us all, that we should at once return to Villa Rica, as the country there was at peace, that we ought not to wait for another battle like the last, and they said more to the same effect. Cortez, noticing that they spoke somewhat haughtily, considering that their words took the form of unasked advice, answered them very gently. It is true enough that they grumbled at Cortez and cursed him, and even at us who had advised him, and at the Sempoalans who had brought us here, and said other unworthy things, but in such times they were overlooked. Finally, all were fairly obedient. When Masayascasi and Chicotenga the Elder and the greater number of the caciques of the capital of Tlaxcala sent four times to tell their captain not to attack us, but to go and treat for peace, he was very close to our camp, and they sent to the other captains who were with him, told them not to follow him unless it was to accompany him when he went to see us peacefully. 
As Shikotenga was bad-tempered and obstinate and proud, he decided to send forty Indians with food, poultry, bread, and fruit, and four miserable-looking old Indian women, and much copal and many parrot's feathers. From their appearance, we thought that the Indians were, who brought this present came with peaceful intentions, and when they reached our camp, they fumigated Cortez with incense without doing him reverence, as was usually their custom. They said, the Captain Jigotenga sends you all this so that you can eat. If you are a savage Teuls, as the Sempoalans say you are, and if you wish for a sacrifice, take these four women and sacrifice them, and you can eat their flesh and hearts. But as we do not know your manner of doing it, we have not sacrificed them now before you. But if you are men, eat the poultry, and the bread and fruit. And if you are tame Teuls, we have brought you copal and parrot's feathers. Make your sacrifice with that. Cortez answered through our interpreters that he had already sent to them to say that he desired peace, and had not come to make war, but had come to entreat them and make clear to them that they should not kill or sacrifice any one, as was their custom to do, that we were all men of bone and flesh just as they were, and not Teus, but Christians, and that it was not the custom to kill any one, that we, had we wished to kill people, many opportunities of perpetrating cruelties during the frequent attacks they had made on us both by day and night, and for the food they had brought we gave them thanks, that they were not to be as foolish as they had been, but should now make peace. It seems that these Indians whom Shikotenga had sent with the food were spies. They remained with us that day and the following night, and some of them went with messages to Shikotenga, and others arrived. Our friends from Sempoala were sure that they were spies, and were the more suspicious of them in that they had been told that Shikotenga was all ready with a large number of warriors to attack our camp by night, and the Sempoalans at that time took it for a joke or bravado, and not believing it, they had said nothing to Cortez, but Doña Marina heard of it at once, and she repeated it to Cortez. So as to learn the truth, Cortez had two of the most honest-looking of the flash collins taken apart from the others, and they confessed that they were spies. Then two others were taken, and they also confessed, and added that their captain, Chico Tango, was awaiting their report to attack us that night with all his companies. When Cortez heard this, he let it be known throughout the camp that we were to keep on the alert. Then he had seventeen of those spies captured and cut off the hands of some and the thumbs of others, and sent them to the captain Shikotenga to tell him that he had them thus been punished for daring to come in such a way, and to tell him that he might come when he chose by day or by night, for we should await him here two days, and that if he did not come within those two days, that we would go and look for him in his camp, and that we would already have gone to attack them and kill them, were it not for the liking we had for them and that now they should quit their foolishness and make peace. They say that it was at that very moment that those Indians set out with their hands and thumbs cut off that Shikotenga wished to set out from his camp with all his forces to attack us by night, as had been arranged. But when he saw his spies returning in this manner, he wondered greatly and asked the reason of it, and they told him all that had happened. And from this time forward he lost his courage and pride. In addition to this, one of his commanders, with whom he had wrangles and disagreements during the battles which had been fought, had left the camp with all his men. While we were in camp, and were busy polishing our arms and making arrows, each one of us doing what was necessary to prepare for battle, at that moment one of our scouts came hurrying in to say that many Indian men and women with loads were coming along the high road from Tlaxcala and were making for our camp. Cortez and all of us were delighted of this news, for we believed that it meant peace, as in fact it did, and Cortez ordered us to make no display of alarm and not to show any concern, but to stay hidden in our huts. Then. From out of all those people who came bearing loads, the four chieftains advanced who were charged to treat for peace, according to the instructions given by the old caciques. Making signs of peace by bowing the head, they came straight to the hut where Cortez was lodging, and placed one hand on the ground, and kissed the earth, and three times made obeisance and burnt copal, and said that all the caciques of Tlaxcala and their allies and vassals, friends and confederates, 
were come to place themselves under the friendship and peace of Cortez and of his brethren, the Teules, who accompanied him. They asked his pardon for not having met us peacefully, for the war which they had waged on us, for they had believed and held for certain that we were friends of Montezuma and his Mexicans, who have been their mortal enemies from times long past, for they saw that many of his vassals who paid him tribute had come in our company, and they believed that they were endeavoring to gain an entry into their country by guile and treachery, as was their custom to do, so as to rob them of their women and children. And this was the reason why they did not believe the messengers whom we had sent to them, that now they came to beg pardon for their audacity, and had brought us food, and that every day they should bring more, and trusted that we would receive it with the friendly feeling with which it was sent, that within two days the Captain Chicotenga would come with other caciques, and give a further account of the sincere wish of all Tlaxcala to enjoy our friendship. As soon as they had finished their discourse, they bowed their heads and placed their hands on the ground and kissed the earth. Then Cortes spoke to them through our interpreters very seriously, pretending he was angry, and said that there were reasons why we should not listen to them, and should reject their friendship, for as soon as we had entered their country we sent to them offering peace, and had told them that we wished to assist them against the enemies, the Mexicans, and they would not believe it, and wished to kill our ambassadors. And not content with that, they had attacked us three times, both by day and by night, and had spied on us and held us under observation, and in the attacks which they made on us we might have killed many of their vassals, but he would not, and he grieved for those who were killed, but it was their own fault, and he had made up his mind to go to the place where the old chiefs were living, and to attack them, but as they had now sought peace in the name of the province... He would receive them in the name of our lord the king, and thank them for the food they had brought. He told them to go at once to their chieftains and tell them to come, or send to treat for peace with fuller powers, and that if they did not come, we would go to their town and attack them. He ordered them to be given some blue beads to be thanked to their caciques as a sign of peace, and he warned them that when they came to our camp it should be by day, and not by night, lest we should kill them. Then those four messengers departed and left in some Indian houses a little apart from our camp, the Indian women whom they had brought to make bread, some poultry, and all the necessaries for service, and twenty Indians to bring wood and water. From now on they brought us plenty to eat, and when we saw this, and believed that place, the peace was a reality, we gave great thanks to God for it. It had come in the nick of time, for we were already lean and worn out and discontented with war, not knowing or being able to forecast what would be the end of it. As our Lord God, through his great loving kindness, was pleased to give us victory in those battles in Tlaxcala, our fame spread throughout the surrounding country, and reached the ears of the great Montezuma and the great city of Mexico, and if hitherto they took us for Teus, from now on they held us in even greater respect as the valiant warriors, and terror fell on the whole country at learning how, being so few in number, and the Tlaxcalans in such great force, we had conquered them, and that they had sued us for peace. So that now Montezuma, the great prince of Mexico, powerful as he was, was in fear of our going to his city, and sent five chieftains, men of much importance to our camp at Tlaxcala to bid us welcome, and say that he was rejoiced at our great victory against so many squadrons of warriors, and he sent a present, a matter of a thousand dollars worth of gold, in very rich jeweled ornaments, worked in various shapes, and twenty loads of fine cotton cloth, and he sent word that he wished to become the vassal of our great emperor, and that he was pleased that we were already near his city, on account of the good will that he bore Cortez and all his brothers, the Teules who were with him, and that he, Cortez, should decide how much tribute he wished for every year from our great emperor, and that he, Montezuma, would give it in gold and silver, cloth and chalchuites, provided we would not come to Mexico. This was not because he would not receive us with the greatest willingness, but because the land was rough and sterile, and he would regret to see us undergo such hardships, which perchance he might not be able to alleviate as well as he could wish. Cortez answered by saying that he highly appreciated the goodwill shown us, and the present would have been sent, and the offer to pay tribute to his majesty, 
and he begged the messengers not to depart until he went to the capital of Tlashkala, as he would dispatch them from that place, for they could see then how that war had ended.